this is your discussion on herniated vertebral disc. So when I talk about herniated vertebral disc, this may also be referred to as ruptured disc. It is also referred to as herniated nucleus pulposus, and this is also referred to as slip disc. Being a spinal cord problem, your herniated vertebral disc is actually common among healthcare professionals, especially that we are dealing with the lifting of your patients. Now, when I talk about your vertebral disc, we need to take note of these anatomical areas. So this one is your referred is referred to as your annulus fibrosus, and this one is your nucleus pulposus. So recall that uh, your vertebral disc or intervertebral disc is located between your two vertebra. Okay, so that serves as a cushion between your two vertebra. So whenever this disc will be going out of this space, you refer to that one as your herniated vertebral disc. Now, so it is the rupture of your cartilage that would surround the intervertebral disc that would result to the protrusion of your nucleus pulposus. So once there is a rupture of this uh, cartilage surrounding your intervertebral disc, your nucleus pulposus will be going out of that space, hence referred to the condition as herniated vertebral disc. If you would look at this diagram on the right, one of the concerns that you would have in the herniation of your vertebral disc is the possible compression of the spinal nerve that would lead to um, that would lead to manifestations such as your pain and then weakness. Okay, so this is another image of your herniated vertebral disc. Okay, here is another image of your herniated vertebral disc. As you can see, the disc is already compressing on the spinal cord, leading to inflammation and then later on ischemia of your spinal cord. Okay, so this is more common in men than in women between the ages of 30 to 50. The most common sites are L4, L5, your lumbar area, then you have your S1, then you have your C6 to C7. It, it may be abrupt, it may also be gradual. But the tendency is that your patient would notice that there is a sudden onset of pain, but this problem had been developing for long already. Okay, so pathophysiology. It may be related to trauma. You can have fall, sudden twisting, lifting of heavy objects. In the case of healthcare professionals such as nurses, that would be lifting of your patients without the aid of your assistive devices or without the aid of your lifting devices. Okay, there could be a condition referred to as spontaneous herniation. And then this happens when the nucleus pulposus would protrude through a weakened or torn annulus ruptured disc. So recall earlier that the annulus is the one that surrounds your pulposus. So whenever there is a weakness of your annulus, the tendency of your pulposus is to go out of that weakening of your annulus. Now, in herniation, it, uh, there is a central pressure on the spinal cord, and the classic manifestations would include that of your lumbar disc herniation and recurrent episodes of low back pain. Okay, some patients are thinking that they may be fatigued okay, or, or they may just had a hard day. That's why they're having low back pain. However, if this is recurring, the tendency is that your patient is already having disc herniation. Then you have your sciatica pain. When I say sciatica pain, your sciatica pain is pain and tenderness that would radiate along your sciatic nerve. That's why it's referred to as sciatica. So your sciatic nerve is a nerve that runs through the thigh and leg. So if you would look at the diagram on the right, it illustrates what are the areas which are innervated by your sciatic nerve. So the compression actually happens on the root or the upper part of your sciatic nerve. But because of that compression, the pain will be radiating towards your entire leg. Okay, So it may be on the right or the left. So the areas of pain are in red. Okay, and that may be caused also by disc herniation on this part of your spinal column. Now, when I talk about sciatica pain, it is usually due to the pressure of the spinal nerve roots found at your L4, L5, S1, 2, S3. That is where the nerve root of your sciatica could be found. Okay, And with that compression, it would lead to pain on this part of your leg. Then, uh, to test for your sciatica pain, you have what you refer to as your straight leg raising test. So, this is positive. Okay, This is testing for pain when lifting the leg while dorsiflexing the foot. Okay, so when you are slowly lifting the leg of your patient while you are dorsiflexing, meaning the foot of the patient is pointing towards the body, once pain is positive, you would, uh, you would think that there is a problem with the sciatica nerve. Okay, this position would cause extension of your sciatica nerve and then if it is irritated, it would cause pain when you are doing your straight leg raising test. 
Okay? So, your sciatica pain is relieved by bed rest. A patient with sciatica would usually have a postural deformity. And the postural deformity is described as that when the patient is standing, there is a slight forward tilt to the trunk, there is scoliosis of your lumbar spine, slight flexion of the hip and knee on the affected side. Okay? This position is done by the patient in such a way that the body is trying to reduce the pain on that side of the leg. Okay? So, because of that prolonged uh, attempt to reduce the pain on that side of the body so the patient is having signs and symptoms congruent to your scoliosis. Your patient with sciatica will also have paravertebral muscle spasms. So the paravertebral muscle spasms is brought about by uh, your paravertebral muscle spasms is brought about by the pain experience that they are having. So here are some of the diagnostic tests that can be done for the patient. So a flat plate x-ray could be done of the cervical and lumbosacral region. So that would uh, identify skeletal deformities and possibly narrowing of the disc spaces. Your CT scan is used to identify the disc rupture or protrusion. Your CT scan could in fact provide the definitive diagnosis. Although your MRI is more detailed, then you have your myelography. So in myelography, you're using your contrast media. And then again, you have your electromyography okay, to confirm confirm if what part of the uh, spine is uh, functioning well and not. For the drug therapy, you will have your NSAIDs, NSAIDs of course for pain, then you have muscle relaxants. Because remember, we have paravertebral muscle spasms. So your muscle relaxants such as your baclofen, you also have your chlorzoxazone, and then your cyclobenzaprine. Your chlorzoxazone is a centrally acting muscle relaxant. So all of them are actually muscle relaxants that would treat muscle spasm that would result to pain or discomfort. Okay, so muscle spasms is the one resulting to pain and discomfort. We're treating that. Uh, commonly, these medications will act on the spinal cord by depressing the reflexes. And then we are giving your corticosteroids to stop the inflammatory processes. Okay, then you have your management. Weight reduction is recommended for these patients because your heavy weight could possibly stress your spinal column, your spinal cord too. Apply moist heat and massage that would help relax the muscles. Okay, so warm application is recommended if you're having your pain to relax the muscles. Exercise program is recommended. And then you would have your physical therapy. In physical therapy, they would usually be doing your TENS application. Okay, so your TENS is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. So shown on the right is an example of your TENS device. There are TENS devices which are sold in the outpatient basis. However, you need a prescription of the physician on the proper use of your TENS. Okay, now in abroad, usually your, uh, these problems could also be managed by visiting a chiropractor. Then you have the procedure again, laminectomy. As discussed earlier, your laminectomy would involve the removal of your lamina to relieve the pressure on the nerve. So it is combined with the removal of the protruding nucleus pulposus also, which would relieve the pressure on the nerve. So class, uh, this is an example of, or no, this image is actually just showing the uh, anatomical location of your lamina. So that's why the procedure is referred to as laminectomy. So this is the end product of your laminectomy procedure wherein the lamina is already removed. So it has relieved already the pressure to your spinal cord. Then you have your discectomy. So in your discectomy, that would involve the removal of your nucleus pulposus. So the removal of the nucleus pulposus is again done okay, to, remove your, okay, to remove the compression on your spinal cord. Then you have the procedure spinal fusion. In spinal fusion, that would involve insertion of a wedge-shaped piece of bone or bone chips or metal rods between the vertebra to stabilize them. So as you can see, if this is your vertebra class, okay, normally there's a space here, okay, there should be a space here. So what happens is that bone chips are inserted here and the purpose of that bone chips is to stabilize this vertebra, to immobilize this vertebra, to prevent impingement and to prevent compression on the other spinal nerves. Okay, so spinal fusion, basically you fuse the two spine or the two vertebra. Okay, then you have your foraminotomy. So you have your foramen. Foramen is where okay, your spinal cord is passing through. Foramen is a hole when we are talking about anatomy. So what happens in foraminotomy is there is enlargement of the opening between the disc and the facet of the joint to remove bony overgrowth compressing the nerve. So in this case, class, your foraminotomy, no, some bone is cut or shaved away to open the nerve root opening. So you are enlarging the nerve root opening okay, to facilitate or to reduce the 
pressure or compression on the nerve. Okay, then you have the complications of disc surgery. So one of the problems that you have is your arachnoiditis and then you also have your adhesion or scarring. Okay, so common class, your arachnoiditis would manifest also with pain. As an inflammatory process, your patient may also have fever. Then you have adhesions and scarring. Arachnoiditis is usually described also as severe stinging pain. So nursing care for these patients. Okay, so the following nursing diagnosis, you'll have acute pain. You'll also have self-care deficit. The risk for disuse syndrome related to immobility. Situational low self-esteem because this is a chronic problem. And then your patient would also manifest of anxiety because of the uncertainty whether the back pain would still be relieved or not. Oftentimes, class, this patient would have problems with quality of life and then they need to be transferred on their area of assignment on areas wherein there will be minimal workload or minimal heavy lifting. Okay, so this patient would usually, especially if you're dealing with a nurse, okay, the nurse would usually have difficulty on which unit she will be assigned. So this use syndrome is related to immobility, meaning the part of the body which is having pain is rarely used by your patient. So for that reason, that part has a tendency to atrophy and then later on it would not be able to function anatomically. Self-care deficit due to too much pain, your patient is unable to carry out also activities of daily living. Dear students, this will be the end of the discussion.